Well, thanks for joining. Welcome to the Pre-K for Kids Town Hall for Families. We're very happy to have you with us. Our town hall is being recorded in both English and Spanish. So with that, I will turn it over to David Brody. Thank you, Nicole. Um, welcome everyone. My name is David Brody. I'm the executive director at First Five Santa Cruz County and I'll be your host this evening. Um, I can't tell you how excited we are to see you all here. And on behalf of First Five uh, and our whole team, as well as all of our partners that have helped put this together, I really wanna commend all of you and all of the parents that are here tonight for participating in uh, our town hall. <laughs> Um, as, as many of you know, there are just so many changes going on in the early care and education sector in California right now that um, it can feel, frankly, overwhelming. Um, it can feel overwhelming even to professionals like myself and my colleagues who work in this area uh, and get to think about child development and early learning systems and changes in state policy and programs, you know, essentially every day. Um, it can feel overwhelming to us. And so we can only imagine uh, how it might feel to many of you, um, to hardworking parents who have jobs and responsibilities, um, you know, that don't require you to think about universal pre-kindergarten, expanded transitional kindergarten and changes in state policy, you know, every day of, of the week. Um, but we, know, we do know that what you all think about every day, as evidenced in part by you being here tonight, is how you can do the best for your kids and how you can make um, sure that they have the best preschool experience possible, an experience that will set them up to be ready for school and with your ongoing love and guidance um, to be happy, healthy, and successful kids and eventually adults. Um, we know that you all are committed to that. And what we want you to know is um, that we're essentially, we're committed to the same thing. Tonight, we have some wonderful speakers who are going to talk to us about what universal pre-K is all about, um, highlight some of the options that will be available to you and your pre-K age kids in the fall. Um, and they're going to point you in the right direction so you can begin applying uh, and if necessary, enroll in the program of your choice. Um, a few things I wanna emphasize before we jump forward into the agenda is first, as we have alluded to, you know, our sector is going through a lot of changes. Um, and through the leadership of Superintendent Sabah, the County Office of Education, Diane Munoz and the Children Childhood Advisory Council um, and others, there are forums where our childcare community, our early learning and care community can come together and is coming together to talk about what those changes mean for the programs, for our administrators, and for most importantly, the teachers in our sector. And it's really good. It's incredibly good and important that we have those forums for those discussions to happen. But tonight isn't exactly about that. Tonight's town hall is about helping parents understand, in particular, the changes that are taking place, the options that will be available in the fall, and really how to make the best enrollment decision possible based on the needs and strengths of each and every child and family. So again, um, because this is a complex system with so many changes, um, we couldn't possibly talk about all of it in one night. Um, so tonight, we're going to primarily focus on the publicly funded systems, primarily but not exclusively, including pre-kindergarten and transitional kindergarten in California, available in California, and of course, in Santa Cruz County. And even with that relative narrow scope, um, we couldn't possibly cover everything. And frankly, we don't know everything in part because there are a lot of changes that are still happening in the system. Um, so what we hope to do tonight, frankly, is just what uh, Julio Andrade said, a member of our planning team, um, is provide you all with enough information um, simply so that you can make the first step or take that first important step in making this important decision for you and your family going into the fall of next year. Um, and we really just want you to know that you're not alone in figuring this out. We want you to understand and have a strong sense that there are many, many dedicated professionals in this county, um, many dedicated caring professionals who are committed to the well being of your kids. Um, from the County Office of Education uh, uh, to the Child Development and Resource Center represented here tonight, from our public school systems, 
um, our private community-based organizations, and even First Five. We are here now and in the future to help you make the best possible decisions for your kids and your family in the coming school year. So with that said, let's get the meeting started. Um, first, we'd like to invite everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd love it if you would type your name and the ages of your children, if you have any, and even if they're grownups, we'd love to know, and just do that right into the chat. So if everybody just starts typing in who they are, that would be awesome. I'm gonna do it myself. I can't believe I'm saying this. My kids are 14 and 17, what happened? Um, but that's, that's what we're looking for, just to get a sense of who's in the room uh, and what, what the age of the kids uh, uh, in your family. So as people keep doing that, please continue to enter um, your names uh, in the chat and just keep doing that as we continue with our presentation. Okay, and as people enter their names, we're also gonna do a poll to help us understand just a little bit about who's in the room. Um, so the poll is about to come up and we're just asking folks to indicate um, essentially if you're a parent, if you're a child care provider or a teacher, uh, maybe just an, in, not just, but maybe an interested community member or other. And if you do select other, um, please use a second question to describe yourself in more detail. And so we're just waiting for um, folks to participate. Looks like people are, are rolling in with their answers. Diane, I see you here. You beat me in the ages of your children by just a little bit. I'm right behind you. Let's see, we're almost there. We're getting towards 50% on our poll. All right. Let's see, Charlemagne. Sorry if I got that name right. 2.9, love it. And we're just at 51%. So just another couple seconds for people to fill in the poll. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Dolores. Okay, Hi, I'll Brenda. close the poll in five more seconds, David. Five seconds on the poll. Get your answers in. Three, two, one. Hey. All right, awesome. All right, so everybody can see this now, right? So as you can see in the screen that hopefully just popped up in front of you, this is great to see. Uh, just over 50% of all of you are parents. That's wonderful. That's uh, what, what we're here for tonight. Uh, but you also see we have good representation of childcare uh, providers or teachers. And then actually a lot, 32% uh, uh, indicated others. So great that we have a variety of folks who came um, interested in, in what we have to share about um, what's changing in our pre-K sector. All right. Okay, sorry, here we go. That was the poll. Thank you everybody for participating. Um, before we get into the agenda, I wanna take a moment just briefly to thank our partners who are co-hosting tonight's town hall. Of course, First Five Santa Cruz County. Um, as I said, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, the Child Development Resource Center, uh, within the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, and of course, also core investments with Santa Cruz County and really the, our entire community. Um, as a reminder, as Nicole said earlier, if you need assistance with the Zoom in any way during the town hall, send a private chat to Nicole Young or Nicole Levin, uh, and somebody will reach out to you from the core team and help you with whatever challenge you might be uh, facing with the Zoom. Hopefully there won't be any, but you never know. Um, also, I wanna recognize that the core team uh, who are very grateful for helping us put this whole presentation together tonight is providing bilingual support for the town hall. In particular, simultaneous interpretation in Spanish uh, and English is being provided by Stella Lauerman. Thank you, Stella. And our bilingual chat support and translation provided by Gisela Carrasco. Thank you, Gisela. Okay, moving right along. Um, as I said, I'm really excited about tonight's town hall agenda. Um, we've planned it with you and other parents like you in mind. Um, what we're gonna do tonight is provide an overview of what universal pre-kindergarten is, then describe the main options um, that are available uh, for publicly funded pre-K and how to enroll. 
After that, we'll have time for some questions and answers uh, with a panel, and then we'll close the town hall. Um, along the way, and this is really important, we encourage you to post your questions in the comments in the chat. So use the chat to post questions and please feel free to do it as the presentations are being made so you don't forget them uh, or lose that thought. Um, and as you're posting those and as the presentations are happening, our core team will help, keep us, help us keep track of the questions and have them organized um, uh, uh, for the panel at the, end of the, at the end of the session. Okay. Um, so now I want to just briefly introduce our amazing speakers. We are very fortunate to have some highly knowledgeable and respected leaders uh, in the early learning and education fields joining us tonight. Uh, as I said, I'm David Brody. I'm serving as your host and MC. Um, you're just in a moment going to hear from Dr. Ferris Sabah, our county superintendent of schools. Uh, then you'll hear from Kathy Lathrop, a local education consultant who was formerly the director of um, child development programs for Pajaro Valley Unified School District, so a very knowledgeable person in this space. And Sita Moon, another very knowledgeable person who is our coordinator of the Child Development Resource Center at the County Office of Education. Um, everybody's gonna take some turns presenting information that they have to share. And then, then as I mentioned, we'll move to a panel format to answer the questions that we get from all of you. And we'll be joined by a couple other uh, great local experts um, who I'll introduce when we get to that portion of the agenda. Okay, moving right along. So as I said, right now, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Ferris Sabah, um, who is gonna help us understand California's vision uh, for universal, excuse me, and goal for universal preschool. So with no further ado, thank you, Dr. Sabah, for being here. And I turn over the forum to you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here and, uh, and to be with uh, all these partners. We're all working together as parents, as, as, uh, as partners to uh, provide the best opportunities for our students in, in, in Santa Cruz County. Uh, what I'd, I'd like to share with you just a little bit uh, about why there is uh, such a, uh, an investment in, in early learning. Why is it so important? And uh, to help clarify the, uh, what universal pre-K is about, what universal transitional kindergarten is about, and why this is important. And, and we're looking at this, this whole presentation from the point of view as parents. If I, as a parent of a, of a, of a preschool child, what are my options? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my child? And so we're, we're really uh, wanting to, to create some clarity about this because it can be a little bit complicated. It's a little bit confusing for us and, and we wanna try to bring as much clarity and answer as many questions as, 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 as you had. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and, and so that we can answer them as well. Um, I'd like to go to the next slide. So the big question of course is why, why is early learning so important? And it's important to note that early learning, early childhood education, and, and I think many of you know, um, is considered the most important time for learning and growth for our children. And so when we think about, uh, when we think about uh, that 90% of a child's brain development happens in the first five years, we have to recognize how important the, the, that time is. And that, uh, you know, if we're able to provide an exciting, engaging environment for our children, that their learning is, experiences, their relationships, their environments, all the things that surround children uh, from birth until the age of five, it gives them a foundation for all of their lives. And so um, it promotes having, uh, you know, effective uh, quality early learning experiences, helps them with their development, and it also supports parents as the first teachers of, of children. Children who get uh, quality early uh, learning are more likely to be ready for kindergarten. They're more likely to be reading at grade level by third grade. They're more likely to be successful in middle school and high school and to graduate and to go on to, to college and post-secondary. And so I think the world now more than ever recognizes something that most parents have known for a long time, which is the more time that we spend, the more emphasis, the more quality, the more investment that we put in those early years, the, the more impact it's going to have on the lives of our children. And, and really what we're talking about today is making sure that our children have access, that all our children have access to very quality uh, early learning experiences, because that's going to help them throughout their lives. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. So um, we recognize that, that, you know, that, that, and I think 
the research shows it and 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 now the state is recognizing it and so they're investing in in making sure that the reason why we have these powerful learning experiences for children is because of how it's going to impact them uh, throughout their, their their schooling and um and th their lives from from beyond and so um we want our students to flourish we want students to to um, have an opportunity to be able to uh, to help them not only in those first five years because we know that it's going to help them um, as they get older throughout their their schooling and as adults later on and so California has really invested in uh, in seeing and creating a vision for having effective programs for students and so they have established a vision to provide a strong early start to education for all children. And then listen to these descriptions. So it has to be high quality, has to be joyful because students have to, our children have to enjoy it. Um, development, developmentally informed, it has to be appropriate for their age level, inclusive so that we're not limiting it to anybody and, and any, we're not only including certain students and not others. It needs to be rigorous and that it's it's uh, effective and it's 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 helping students, it's challenging students, and and, and they're they're always learning new things. And it has it's for pre-kindergarten, so their experience before they go to kindergarten through third grade. And this is really important, I think, which is that the and, and for a long time there has been a little bit of a, a a big division between school and kindergarten through twelfth grade and the the pre-kindergarten and the preschool world. And really, what the vision for California is to create a continuous learning experience that is appropriate for children from pre-kindergarten through third grade and beyond. And really that's the vision that California has established for, for um, us, for our children. And so what is the goal of universal pre-K? Um, it's really, uh, it's a collection of all of the different programs and services that exist. And really, when we think about universal pre-K, universal means it's everybody. Pre-K means it happens before students are in kindergarten. It includes a lot of the programs you're familiar with. It's, it includes programs like the California State Preschool Program that you may, may have your children enrolled in. It includes programs like Head Start, uh, community-based organizations, um, and also universal transitional kindergarten, which is a, uh, a program that is um, that we're going to be talking about more, but it's one that will give students uh, kind of that bridge into into kindergarten for for and and the idea is to offer all students every four year old child regardless of their background regardless of their race regardless of, of their zip code or or their immigration status or immig or income level um, that they have access to this quality learning experience um, the year before kindergarten because we recognize the state recognizes that we have to offer this quality experience for children to help them as they as they prepare to transition into kindergarten. And let's go to the next slide. So Universal TK, um, it came out, uh, has been, uh, the idea is that making uh, transitional kindergarten available to all uh, students um, for who are uh, gonna be four years old. The idea is that um, we're offering a high quality developmentally appropriate program. Um, the parents will be able to choose uh, for their four-year-old and every year they're gonna be increasing the, the months of when your child turns five so that you're able to, um, you're able to by the year 25, 26, every four-year-old child, the parents of every four-year-old child will be able to choose a TK uh, option uh, for their children. So this is an, in addition to the other options that you have available, you will have transitional kindergarten available as an option for your child. And every year there's gonna be, we're gonna be able to add more and more of the, of the children who are, um, who are turning five. So those four-year-olds, by the year 25, 26, every four-year-old in California, their parents will be able to choose transitional kindergarten for, for their child. And let's go to the next slide. And so districts are required to offer uh, transitional kindergarten um, for all children that are eligible. And so we'll be talking about the, the, the months when your child is born and when you'll be able to choose this option for your child. Um, and it's, so it's gonna get phased in and you'll have an option if you wanna enroll your children in, in this program. Uh, parents are also able to choose other pre-kindergarten options such as the, the California State Preschool Program, such as Head Start, um, if you're eligible for those programs. 
And if parents continue to, to, um, uh, to choose the, the local uh, school's existing preschool program instead of uh, TK, the district uh, TK enrollment may end up being relatively small. So, so as children in the TK program might actually be a, a relatively small number of students. And we'll be talking about the numbers of students per adult uh, in each of those programs. And so to talk to you a little bit more about um, the options that families have, I'd like to welcome uh, Kathy Lathrop, who is a expert in child development and uh, somebody I've gotten to work with for about 20 years. And uh, she is actually consulting with us to support schools in the development of their universal pre-K program options. And so uh, Kathy, take it away. Thank oh, actually, I'm, am I supposed to give it? I'm sorry, David. Oh, no, I'm supposed to fine. turn it you over to you. I just want to say thank you. Kathy, you got it. Okay. Welcome, wonderful parents and families. Thank you so much for being here. Um, um, your child has options. When you, if you have three-year-old child, their options might be for enrollment in an early care and education program in a preschool, in a Head Start, or in a family child care home. Um, some of these, let's see here, yeah. And if you have a four-year-old child that will be turning by five, you would still have all those options, preschool, Head Start, or family child care home. And your child qualifies for a TK depending on their birth date. You know, that we're gonna show you that phase in in a minute. And a little point I wanna to make too is, some families are enrolling their children in both things. So a child might go to TK in the morning and then go to a preschool in the afternoon or go to a, a childcare setting in the afternoon. So we know, we know folks are working. And um, so that's another option. slide. Can you move the slide? Thank you. Oh, here we are. <laughs> uh, preschools are operated by public schools sometimes, community agencies, private programs, and like we said, family child care homes. Transitional kindergarten programs are only operated within the public school setting. They're a state-funded um, Equal opportunity uh, program, and they're they're all well. They're only operated on their public school campuses. The classrooms for preschool and transitional kinder are a little bit different and a little bit the same. In a preschool classroom, you would always have one adult for every eight to twelve children. And usually the classrooms have a maximum number of students that are under 24. It varies a little bit by different programs. A transitional kindergarten classroom has one adult for every 12 children in 2022 and a maximum class number of 24. In subsequent years, depending on funding with the state, that ratio in transitional kinder might go down to one to every 10 children. But right for next year, it's one to one adult for every 12 children in a classroom. The costs can be different. Um, preschools may be free, usually that's dependent on a on an income qualification, or have a fee or a copay. Transitional kindergarten, however, as a public school program, is free and there is no charge. Just like first grade or a third grade or other grade levels at your local school. The locations for services vary a little bit. Preschool programs as they're operated by um, all these different agencies, community-based agencies, Head Starts, districts, whatever, they can be anywhere. They might be just down the street from you. Um, they might be out in rural areas. And usually you enroll at a main agency office for that particular program or at the preschool site. And that varies. A transitional kindergarten, uh, you would attend in your school district of residence. And so there's, there's areas, you probably know what your school district is from your neighbors and other kids around you, um, other families around you. And then the school you would go to is in your uh, boundary area or your 
address, depending on your address. And again, you would enroll at school offices or at a main district office to make sure your child gets that opportunity. Um, you can, at, at preschool, you can attend any location. Oh, you, there we go. They'll go back. We're ready to move forward. Thank you. Some of the TK programs in, in Santa Cruz County where TKs are gonna be located in the public schools are on this chart. Um, Happy Valley Elementary will have a, a campus uh, at the Happy Valley um, School. And Soquel Union, High School, Union School District will have campuses at Soquel, Main Street, and Santa Cruz Gardens. Bonnie Doon Unified Elementary will have a school at Pacific. Live Oak School District will have TK classrooms at Del Mar, Live Oak, and Green Acres. And San Lorenzo Valley Unified will have a TK classroom at Boulder Creek and San Lorenzo Valley. Pacific Elementary at Pacific Elementary. Scotts Valley Unified at Brook Knoll Vine and Vine Hill. Santa Cruz City Schools at Bayview, Westlake, Galt, and De La Viega, and Mountain at Mountain Elementary, and the Pajaro Unified School District will have uh, TK classrooms at Amesti, Calabasas, Hall, Hyde, Mar Vista, Mini White, Radcliffe, Starlight, and Valencia. And so you, you may, the, the elementary school that's right in your neighborhood or that you, you know would go, you would go to, your child would go to, may not have a TK, but there would be a TK opportunity for you within that school district at another school site. The ages for TK, this is the thing that makes us study hard. <laughs> um, if your child turns five between September 2nd and February 2nd, 20, year 2022, 2023. These seven districts, that's the required age. Every district has to take children in at that age level. So, but, and these seven districts are offering the services to the children at this required age level of September 2nd to February 2nd. Bonnie Doon, Happy Valley, Live Oak, Pacific Elementary, Pajaro Valley, Santa Cruz City Schools, and SoCal Union. So all the districts. If your child is turning five um, between September 2nd and April 2nd, one district, Mountain District, is expanding their age eligibility, tongue twister, um, next year to that. And Pajaro Valley will consider those children in what they call an ETK, early TK, um, if there's space in the TK classrooms, if they still have openings left. If a child turns five between September 2nd and June 2nd, uh, two districts, San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley, are, will be accepting those children as well. So some districts have kind of an expanded age range. That's, a, that's an option the district can take, but all the districts are required to accept children between September 2nd and February 2nd next year. The qualifications for being a teacher in these different in these two different types of classrooms are different. Teachers in a preschool classroom must have a teacher permit, which is an, usually has an has an associate degree from a community college um, connected. And in that associate degree, they must have 24 units of early childhood education. Many teachers in pre-K have more than that with a bachelor's degree and more ECE units. Some programs actually require more. And the other thing that's, I think, a th good thing to point out is that other staff, your assistants or your associate teachers, other staff within the classroom must also have six to 12 ECE units. So everyone in that preschool cl classroom is specifically trained in early childhood education. In a transitional kindergarten classroom, 
teachers must have a multiple subjects credential, which is a bachelor's degree and a year of teacher preparation. It's the same credential that your second grade teacher or your fourth grade teacher would have. And as well, TK teachers, this is new to the state of California, I applaud them for this, um, The TK teachers must obtain 24 units of early childhood education by the year 2022. So you're, um, some, some districts are using existing kindergarten teachers to come teach their TK. And those kindergarten teachers or those second grade teachers that are gonna come down and work in a TK classroom, they have to then also build their uh, knowledge base about how to work with younger children. Because as you all know, the four-year-olds are a really different kettle of fish than the, the older kids in terms of being able to sit still, being all the things you families all live with day, daily, daily. Other staff does not necessarily have to have any ECE units. So there will be aides and assistants probably hired for these classrooms, as you saw the, the ratios of one to 12, but the additional staff may not have early childhood training. Um, the learning is going to happen for your children. I'm confident having been in lots and lots of each of these types of classrooms in my career, there will be great opportunities for learning for your children. And the learning is guided by um, various standards in preschool, they call them learning foundations. In kindergarten, they're called standards. And um, that set ex expectations for what kind of accomplishments you would want your, to see your child be able to do. So be able to hop, skip, and jump at this level, be able to pick up a book and turn the pages or start to sound out words or the different things that are part of um, young children's learning, count to different numbers, to different levels. And so both programs are guided by this. Well, preschool programs sometimes have uh, programs that are just planned, or a curriculum that's just planned by the teachers, and some have adopted commercial curriculums or some combination of the two. Transitional kindergarten classrooms as part of the public school system are required to adopt a curriculum, and what curriculum they use varies by different districts. As I mentioned before, we know there's great pre-K and TK teachers. And they all have a lot of heart. My experience as teachers are a rare and wonderful breed of people that come into it because they love children. They care about the benefit of their, of their community and their, and their kids. They have skill sets that they've uh, built through education and learning. They have knowledge and then their experience. And I'm confident your child would have a great, um, great success in either setting. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kathy, that was awesome. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Sita Moon, again, the coordinator of our Child Development and Resource Center. Uh, and Sita is gonna talk about how to enroll your children in the program or programs uh, that you choose and how to get help with that if you need it. So Sita, take it away. Thank you, David, and thank you, Kathy and Dr. Sabah for sharing uh, so many details. That is almost an overwhelming amount of information, and now we, we have all these options. What do we do now? So how do you enroll in TK? How do I enroll my child in TK? Uh, if you're interested in TK and you think it might be a good fit for your child and for your family, uh, I would say a good first step would be to look at the website for the school district where you live. On the website, they'll have details about the TK registration process. They'll list out which schools are operating the TK classroom and um, describe how to complete the enrollment packet. I've noticed many districts have an online registration process that you can just complete online at your convenience and then have a personal con connection with the school. 
If internet is not your thing, you don't want to use the internet, you can call the district or visit the school in your area to inquire about TK enrollment. Uh, at that office, they'll be able to determine which elementary school serves your address and help you get the enrollment packet. They'll be able to inform you uh, exactly which site in your district will have the TK class and make sure that your child is the right age to enroll in TK. I just want to mention that there are also a number of private schools that have decided to offer TK programs this year. And if you're interested in private schools, CDRC can provide more information on those schools and uh, give you their uh, contact info. So enro enrollment for transitional kindergarten has already begun. It will be ongoing. Now school is over for the um, this school year. So some of the offices may close down for part of the summer. They will continue with the enrollment when they return. I've noticed that it's um, still a good idea to leave a message or send an email to the school so that as soon as they reopen, you can get in touch with them and continue working on your enrollment um, process for TK. I still feel like it's a very site specific thing. So you really want to investigate a little bit because different school sites may offer different options. Some of the TK classrooms might have longer hours than others. They might have after school care or before school care on the site that's um, offered by the school itself or some uh, after school programs that are uh, private fee paying programs might be, be available on the school sites. So there's a few things to consider. Uh, the list of TK options, it, it might change a little bit as we go through the summer. I feel like as uh, parents are enrolling their children in TK, there might be a little bit of shifting around with the classroom size and um, yeah, schools will be figuring out exactly what kind of uh, TK classrooms will they have? Will they have some that are a combination class with kindergarten? Will they have the younger ones only in their TK program? So there'll be a few things that are still going to be decided, things that you'll want to know about before your, your child actually starts TK. How do I enroll my child in preschool? Next slide. Um, so if you're interested in preschool, and um, well, there's a couple of options. If you're paying for care on your own, it's likely that the enrollment process will take place directly at the preschool site. Many centers I've noticed now have their enrollment packet available on their website. So sometimes you can go to the, the center's website, see all the enrollment paperwork and even start the process online. Um, the enrollment coordinator at that center will usually assist you with the paperwork and then they'll create the parent fee contract and give each family an orientation about the center. You'll want to visit it first, of course. Occasionally, a program will have more than one site. If that's the case, there might be a central office for the enrollment process where one coordinator enrolls for two or three different centers that the same agency owns. If you do decide to choose a fee-based program, remember that you can discuss fees with the director and see if that site has any type of financial assistance program. Some centers have scholarship programs or even sliding fee scales. So you might be able to get a little bit of a break if you have to go to a fee-paying program or if you want to go to a fee-paying program because it's a good match for your family. If you're choosing public state-funded preschool or federally funded Head Start, the enrollment process may be a little bit different. Each family who uses this type of early education program must qualify by meeting the eligibility standards. So this would be based on income, your family size, and whether or not the child has any type of special needs that would help them to qualify for that type of program. There will be eligibility paperwork in addition to the other info, enrollment forms that are required by licensing and, and sometimes some by the center's own process. The enrollment coordinator will help the family get all of the necessary forms completed and some agencies have a centralized enrollment office with a dedicated coordinator. Other agencies may complete the process right at the site where this child will attend preschool. 
normally for subsidized programs, a family would be on a waiting list. And when their eligibility is determined, the preschool would contact the family to start the enrollment paperwork process. All right. What if I need help choosing? Selecting a preschool or a childcare program or a family childcare home can be a really tough decision. There's many factors to consider and things that you're going to weigh up. Do you need care before school, before or after preschool? Um, does your child do well in a large group setting? Are you looking for a certain type of environment such as play-based or academic, bilingual, outdoor setting, structured, relaxed? There is a wide variety of choice available in our community. Or for your family is the most important thing that the site is close to your home because you might have to walk. CDRC can help you connect with one or more programs that may fit your needs and we can give you tips for making your decision. CDRC services are free. Our agency is dedicated to helping families find childcare and preschool programs. Our referral specialists will assist you with finding and choosing an appropriate preschool or childcare program for your child. You can call our main line at 831-466-5820, or you can visit our website to submit an online referral request or even perform your own search. We are located at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education here in North County. We also have an office at the Go Kids Agency in Watsonville. We're state funded California Resource and Referral Agency. Every county has at least one agency like ours. If you don't live in Santa Cruz County, but you need help with your pre-K or your childcare needs, feel free to call us at CDRC and we'll help you locate the resource and referral agency for your county. Okay, on the next slide, this is what it will look like if you go to our website and you fill out a request for assistance with a referral. It's a Google form. You'll put in your information, a few a few pointers for us, such as the age of your child and the hours that you need care. We will go into our database and do a geographical search right around the area where you're uh, living or working or the school where you're looking for care. And then we'll get back to you either by email or by telephone or even by mail, depending upon what you say when you fill out this form. If you don't want to do it that way, you have another option. You can click on the other link and it will take you right into our database. In this one, you'll create a profile so that you can retrieve your information. You'll answer the questions that we would ask if we were doing a referral interview. And you'll, you'll receive uh, the list based on the answers that you put into this form here. You'll get the list and then the next step will be to contact those providers and interview them and visit them and make your hard choice about what you're going to do with your little preschool child. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Sita, that was great. Also a lot of information. I thought you did a great job of just succinctly presenting so much. Uh, and um, I know it's generated some questions as has the um, other presenters and the information that they provided. So we're gonna jump right over to our panel now. Um, so our presenters uh, are the folks that you've seen so far and heard from, Dr. Sabah, Kathy Lathrop, uh, as well as Sita. Uh, and they're also gonna be joined by Melanie Sluggett, who is the Director of Extended Learning and Child Development for the Live Oak School District. And we're also very lucky to have Erendira Guerrero, the Director of Child and Family Development Programs, including Head Start, um, for Encompass Community Services. So Erendira oversees Head Start for the entire county. So please continue to ask questions in the chat. We're organizing those as we speak um, in either English or Spanish. Uh, our core team is helping us with the translations and identifying questions um, that we're gonna, we're gonna bring up right now. So I'm gonna get started. And I think team, we're gonna spotlight our, our panel members if I, if I heard, if I understood right. And as we're getting that set up, we have a couple of questions, a pair of questions that came in um, related to the age of a child. So two questions, my child turns four this October, can he attend TK? And hold on to that one, four by October. And another question, my child turns four by May, 
May 12th specifically. Can she attend TK? Um, Kathy uh, and or Melanie, do you want to take a shot at those questions? Sure, I can jump in. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, your child will not be able to attend TK, but will be able to attend a preschool program. This year in in year in 22-23, they have to be turn five years old between September 2nd and December 2nd specifically. And then if we look back at that chart, there were some districts that extended their day. I'm sorry, September 2nd to February 2nd is this year. I'm thinking back a couple of years. And then some districts, if you were to choose a TK program there, I believe Pajaro is extending it to April 2nd. And that is only if their classes are not filled up with the students who are turning five between September 2nd and February 2nd. So the government are, is, are the people who decided the dates this year. And that's why we, we're following those. But every year we'll gain another month. So if you have two-year-olds and one-year-olds at home, by the time they turn four and five, they may be able to go to Universal TK. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Kathy, did you have something you wanted to say? You're good? You're muted, but I thought I saw some nodding. <laughs> no, she covered it. Thanks. Okay, okay. So in summary, because again, there were two age questions. What I heard from the answer is that, uh, and, and jump in if I got this wrong, and this can be really the most complicated portion of this in some ways, is mm -hmm. the parent who asked my child turns four this October, that's October 22, based on what you said, I believe they would be eligible for TK in every district in the county. And then what are October? So you have to turn five Oh, they said four. You're right. Okay, sorry. See, Whew. sorry about that. Uh, they turned four. So right, your answer is dead on. And then um, the other child, it may be possible depending on the district that you're in. So right. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. We had a question about a couple questions related to just this phase in, which is what complicates the matter so much. And you know, just a general sense that there's. One, it's a little complicated, and it, 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 frankly, I think to some parents, seems unfair. Now, there's nobody on this call that created that phase in schedule or controls it, but I wonder if Dr. Sabah, you might just address that and the feelings that families are having uh, it, it, when they're, you know, looking at these dates and the and when their kids may or may not be eligible. Yeah, I, I think that it, you know, that it is, it does feel unfair for for some parents because you might be off by one month, one year, and miss out on that window. I, the reason why the, the state uh, has, has created this as a phase-in is because they didn't want to open up the window completely for everybody and have all the students enter into and be eligible for the program. Uh, the idea is to try to um, kind of bring in a growing number of students so that schools would have the capacity to be able to be prepared for all students. And so if you're off, just like uh, same thing when, when, you know, when I enrolled my kids and they were, off, they were considered too young to be able to enroll in school, um, you know, that, that does feel somewhat unfair because it's based on their birthday, which doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, a fair uh, uh, kind of limitation, but that's exact, but that is designed on purpose to try to control uh, how many people, how many children can get into the program at this point. Um, it is good. It takes a lot of work for schools to be able to hire the staff, prepare the space, get all the, the, the materials. All of these pieces take a lot of, of, of and so they want to make sure that the schools get the, the, the students in a kind of a, a smaller number at a time and that it increases over time so that by the time I think it's 20, 25, 26, by then we can accept everybody who turns, you know, all four year olds regardless of when they turn five, as long as uh, we'd be ready for all of them. Uh, but until then, we, it's, it's, it, they've, they've created these windows uh, to, to kind of limit that number. Uh, and that was established by the state for, for that reason specifically. I would just add in that um, some of the things uh, Ferris is talking about and schools are working on is um, there has to be access to a bathroom. You know, older kids can go down the hall and around the corner to go to the restroom. Well, you have to have supervision to be able to see where younger children are going and so schools are putting in bathrooms and schools are changing their playgrounds to make them okay for younger children and then there's a big shortage of teachers so there's a big 
push right now to help early childhood teachers that want to become TK teachers get those credentials and then to find people out in the community. Oh, by the way, if any of you want to become a teacher, it's a great time to join education with TK or early childhood. <laughs> I'll add on to that. I agree with both what Dr. Sabah and Kathy have said about the reasons they have this phase in. But I also want to mention that our preschools, we have so many high quality preschools that have been servicing these four-year-olds in the classrooms. So even if you weren't to get into a TK classroom, you can find a very high quality full day preschool, part day preschool to service your child at their developmental level. And I would encourage you to um, connect with the child resource and referral that Sita was talking about. Uh, we have amazing programs in Santa Cruz County. We're kind of one of the pillars in California because we're so in tune to the developmental levels of students and what they need at three years old, four years old and beyond. So I would encourage you to look. And if I could add one more thing, which was that the, the idea that the preschool is gonna to be totally different than TK is not really the case. A lot of this work is about making sure that the TK teacher has uh, uh, training as a, you know, for, for, for that age group, developmentally, developmentally appropriate training. The idea is that the, that, the, that the same kinds of activities are gonna be taking place. In some cases, some parents don't qualify for, for free preschool and TK of course is, is free. And so that, that could be part of the, you know, the, the frustration by, by, by parents. But in terms of getting students ready, uh, children getting them the ready for kindergarten, um, our preschool programs uh, are, you know, are wonderful places to prepare our students for, for kindergarten as well. Thank you all. I thought those responses were great and just I'll try to summarize without muddling the answer but I wanna emphasize some of the points that were made. Again, nobody on this call controls that phase in schedule, but I hope um, the parents listening could at least hear some of the rationale for why a phase in schedule was implemented. Um, and yeah, as a parent, and I think all the folks uh, on this call are parents, we all understand and can very much empathize, empathize you know, how that might feel if you're that family with that kid that's just outside of next year's birthday window or the year after that. Um, but that is what's in place for us. And again, what we're here to do is try to just help folks understand exactly what we have and what the opportunities are. And so building on that is, as Melanie and Ferris and others have said, we have wonderful pre-K programs in this county. Some are able, you're able to access if you're eligible um, for free or no cost. Some are full cost. They are wonderful programs. And we would just really encourage everybody not to make an assumption about what's available or about what they may or may not be eligible for until they really reach out to CDRC and or their local school district and really do some investigation that's specific to your family. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move us on. Thank you for those answers again. We have a question uh, about somebody who works full time. Um, what do I do if I need uh, before and after school care? Um, Maybe uh, Aaron Deera, uh, you run our Head Start program in our county, uh, you, but you know about all the programs. Do you want to take a shot at that? <laughs> For sure. Thank you, David. Um, so this is what's so great about this opportunity with TK is, um, like Kathy said earlier, you have a menu of options that you can mix and match. So for parents that perhaps are interested in TK but need a longer day, could look at some of the state preschool programs that offer part day um, classes. Um, and see how those work out. There's, um, especially in Pajaro, there's a couple of TK uh, sites that are actually next to Head Start centers. Um, so that could be an option. Um, and also this is a time to consider what's really gonna work best in terms of the needs of the family as well as a child. So if a family is working full time and really what they need is full daycare, then I would also recommend looking at uh, preschool programs that offer the, the full day by Community Bridges or Head Start. We have both uh, six hour programs and three and a half hour programs. And so I think um, getting in contact with um, CDRC to find out a little bit more of the different options, kind of the many of options and look at what could be mixed and matched so that it meets the needs of the families. Thank you, uh, Melanie. 
Yes, I'll add on to that. In the Live Oak School District, we've been surveying our parents to find out how many parents do want before school care and after school care. Because we have uh, in place programs at all three of our elementary schools for after school care, we really want to meet the needs of those parents. So we have been sending out surveys. If you're if you don't happen to be in the Live Oak School District or if you've missed my survey, please contact the, your district office or Live Oak School District office, and they will direct you to the person who can take your information and get back to you and include you in the survey or send you the link. We are really trying to meet the needs of our families, and it kind of gets into something else. Um, there's another fund of money from the State Department called ELO Money, and it will encompass the after school programs as well as the before school programs too. So the school districts are all around the county are also looking to service parents for the full day working parent. And the other little thing I'll add to that is as we've been working with school districts um, around the county is many school districts are looking to partner with community-based programs. So maybe you're up in the rural mountain areas of, of our county and there, um, and there isn't, a, you know, the after-school program might be limited. And so there's a lot going on. And so just don't give up. There's funding that's going to support extended childcare times and um, there's eligibility things and there's ways people are stacking and mix and matching, just like Erin Dara said. Thank you all. So yeah, I think this, you know, we mentioned early on that um, this, the, the, what's available is still under development. There's still plans being written. There's still uh, plans being submitted. And so it, while a lot of it is getting set, there's still stuff to be organized still and arrangements that are being made between partners. So all the more important that you just stay in contact, stay in contact with the CDRC, stay in contact with your local district. And really, I, again, I'd emphasize, don't make an assumption um, really test that assumption about what's available to you and your family. And really CDRC can really help you understand that on a real-time basis. Uh, and, and as Sita said, uh, help you uh, through some of these choices. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Here's one that sounds pretty straightforward. How do I find out which district we live in? Um, I remember when I moved to this county, I actually had to call my district to figure out which school we were in and get a printed list of street addresses and look my street address up just to make sure which school I was in. Uh, Melanie uh, or Dr. Sabat, is that how it still is? What do you, what do you, what's your advice to a family? That works. You could also go online uh, and, and uh, one way of, of uh, I'll put the link in the, uh, in the uh, chat. You can also go online and, and put in your address and it'll tell you which school district you belong to. Um, and that's that's kind of the official because it's based on where you what who you vote for 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 school board. And so I'll put that in there. I calling if you're not sure uh, is always a is always a good thing. And, and that way you can you can always call a school district, but you may end up having to make a few calls if you're not if uh, if if you know you call the different school districts. But I'll put the put the, uh, the, the uh, link in the, in the chat so people can look up their address and, and find out what school district they belong to. All right, so maybe I was just a little internet challenge at the time, I don't know. But Melanie, did you have something else you wanted to add? Something I'd like to mention is that um, many school district offices are open during the summer and child development offices are open during the summer. So you don't need to wait. The schools are out of session right now, but they're still working right now. Um, my child development office in the Live Oak School District is open all summer and we it's the best time to come in. Don't wait until school's just opening. Sorry, I get caught up reading all the questions. Um, we have a question about enrollment and uh, if you live in one city and want to enroll in another. The example is I work in Santa Cruz um, but live in Watsonville. So I think the question is, could that parent enroll their child in either of those cities? Uh, I saw um, uh, uh, Kathy's hand come up. You want to jump on that, Kathy? Yeah, all districts have an opportunity. You you have to go to the district office, or it might be available online. I'm not sure. Um, to do an in, what's called an interdistrict transfer. So you just request if you live in one district, you request to be able to go to the other district. And, um, and it's a kind of an agreement between the two, two um, agencies and you have to do a little back and forth paper signing. But um, 
Um, and unless the district does not have room for any additional students, it is, an, it is a, a choice you, of the district to accept your student, but most districts that um, I'm aware of are very facilitative of the family's needs and, and, and wanna really make it work for families. Does that match up with what you understand, Ferris? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you get to start with, as, as uh, Melanie shares, uh, start with the district where you are, uh, your district of residence, which is where you're supposed to send your child. You get a form and, and then you, may, you send it to, you go to the, uh, you could mail it or you could send it into the, the they, they sign off on it. And then you go to the district where you'd like to go. Both the district has to release you and the other district has to accept you. And so uh, you have to put the you would put the reason why you you would like that to uh, to have that option and and uh, and in, in many cases that the, the districts will will accept if they don't accept you do have an option to appeal the decision and um, and uh, it can go to the county board of education if you appeal if if the district uh, decides not to accept your child for that interdistrict transfer you you're able to appeal it. Thank you. Um, and so I think I'm hearing that that answer is really specific to public education and to TK. And one of the things I think it was you, Kathy, that first featured about our California State Preschool or Head Start or other preschool programs is they don't have those same attendance area requirements. Um, Sita or Melanie, do you just want to confirm that or have any comment? Yeah, it's true. Sure. So if you want to attend the Live Oak preschools and you're from Watsonville or Scotts Valley or SoCal, you can come to enroll for live oak school, preschools you it's not based on where you live and that's true of all preschools in the county so in fact I, you only have to live in california as far as i know it'd be a bit of a commute but <laughs> and that would be the same for head start as well right. it's not right. um, address specific great so yeah a real key feature to preschool programs that might be very attractive to families versus a TK where you, you can get moved as others have said, or, but there's just a process you'll have to go through. So it's a little different. Um, a really important question that came up is from a parent um, uh, who's interested in options for children with special needs. Um, they say, I know that ADA protects children from being discriminated against, but cu I'm curious if there are any centers that are more adequately trained or have more experience with special needs children. Uh, maybe I'll turn that one over to Erin Deere at least to get us started. For sure, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, all preschool programs, uh, state or federally funded, are required to serve children with diagnosed disabilities. For Head Start Pacific, we have a requirement to serve 10% of our enrollment for um, say those slots for children with a diagnosed disability. And as a county and early care community, we have been working very, um, you know, we've been working together and really improving the services as we've seen the need increase um, more and more. And so I think every program has specific centers where we have teachers that perhaps have more years of experience working in the classroom, but all the staff are uh, expected to be trained to work with children of all needs. And so I, I really appreciate this question coming from the parents because I think these are the type of questions that are good to ask as you're looking at a program um, is, you know, what is the services that are offered? What are the specific curriculums that um, apply to the services? And also um, to ask what is the support that's offered to parents, for example, when Head Start, we do have staff that attend IEP meetings uh, with parents to help and support and advocate as needed. And we also have a very strong um, partnership with the school districts to make sure that when the child's going to transition into a kinder program, um, that um, we are aware in terms of what goals need to be met or what skills need to be worked on to make that transition as smooth as possible. And so uh, thank you to the parent who wrote that question and note that question to ask when you are reaching out to any program you're interested in. And, and just for I those parents add... that aren't familiar, IEP is Individual Education Plan, which has to be established for any child three and over, right? Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Thank so you. I just wanted to get that in with our acronyms. Uh, Kathy, please. Um, I think that um, we, when I was director in the school district and still stands, we have a variety of inclusion programs, formally called inclusion programs, but as Erendera said, all, all 
programs have mandate to serve. The thing I think that's really important for a parent is to look at, um, as, as we've worked with numerous min hundreds of children with special needs, all different kinds of special needs over the years, a couple of things that I would zero in on as a parent is, what kind of support does your child need within a classroom setting to manage themselves, to learn successfully and so forth? And does the setting you're look, looking at, looking at, considering have that level of support? Does it seem like there's gonna be enough staff there and, and that all staff are being trained or are trained in working with young children? So that's one piece. And then the other piece is, um, location of the SELPA um, services that your child receives, because some public schools, for instance, have a speech therapist on campus, and then the speech therapist, that's very convenient for your child to get the speech therapy services. And, and that, you know, that was just an example, but those are a couple of extra things to think about um, related to your child's special needs and placement what, that you decide on. Thank you, Kathy. This is a really important question. Does anybody else on our panel have anything else they want to add? Great, thanks. And for me, it springs up what I've been emphasizing earlier is don't make assumptions about eligibility till you really dig in. For example, uh, uh, and you're correct me if I'm wrong, Head Start has income eligibility guidelines. Um, but if you have a child with special needs, those income eligibility rules might not apply. So you might be eligible no matter your income. And I, I, that may be correct. true of other programs as well, but just don't, don't make those assumptions until you test them. Okay, let's see. I, got, I am the moderator here. This is so much fun. I personally would keep doing this all night long, but we really committed to letting our panel go and letting all of you go uh, without too much more time. So I believe we're trying to wrap up by 6.15. So I think it's time to move on to the closeout of our forum today. Okay, so, uh, and core team, again, like I said, as we reach the end of these things, I tend to forget some important details. Um, so jump in if I miss something, but I know that we want everybody to complete the feedback poll um, that's gonna pop up on your screen right now. It's there, it's really important. Um, if everyone could just take the time, it'll just take a few seconds um, to complete that poll, It'll really help us understand uh, how valuable or not valuable this presentation was to you today, and also help inform what we might do in the future to continue to support parents as, we, as you all and we all together navigate um, this changing environment for our young kids. Um, we want to emphasize that um, a, the resources that you've, many of the resources you've seen today are going to be provided um, to you. I believe we saw an email asking if the slideshow would be provided. Um, core team, jump in here, but I believe there will be an email follow-up to all registered participants that will include uh, much, if not all, of the resources that we've shared so far. Um, and it looks like the poll is getting filled out. We're uh, still a little under 50%. So please keep working on that poll to answer those questions. And yes, thank you, Nicole. Slides and video recordings will all be shared in the follow-up email. And please look at Melanie Sluggett's screen. Enroll in preschool now. Good marketing, Melanie. Uh, and she's sharing the specific number for Live Oak School District. Melanie is a great representative of Live Oak, a wonderful leader in our community for early care and education. Uh, so thank you for being that advocate, Melanie. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're reaching the end. We really, really appreciate um, all of our panelists, uh, again, the core team for making this meeting go off essentially without a hitch. Um, and most of all, really just wanna thank again, all the parents and members of the community that joined us tonight. Uh, and we, we, we hope to see you again soon with additional information and support. And don't forget, call your local school district, just like Melanie is showing you. Uh, also reach out to the CDRC, they're wonderful and they can help support you in all, these, um, all this complexity, I guess, and in making again, the best possible choice for your wonderful young ones. So thank you very much, everybody.